us all that time. Take a chance, take a chance, take a chance. <laughs> That's at the top. All right. Sarah Nagawa, welcome to Life of Chance podcast. Um, thank you so much for joining me today for my first episode. Um, I'll give a bit of an intro before this conversation has started. So it'll be like a intro that everyone else will hear but you. <laughs> so, um, I just really wanted to say to, to you and to my audience that um, this is a learning process for me. So this is not going to be a polished piece and I am not really apologizing for it. I'm more just giving it as a, as a warning to everyone because this is a journey that I'm going down because I love learning. Um, and this is making me really uncomfortable. And I think if you don't put yourself in uncomfortable situations, you don't grow. So here we are today. I've got, I'm so pleased that I could have someone such as yourself join me on the show because, uh, Sarah, you're one of my one of my greatest friends. We've been colleagues together. We've been teammates. We train bloody hard together. We've been through some of life's highs and lows, but biggest highs and lows together. And I, I'm just so excited to be able to share with maybe one, two, three, four, maybe times ten. <laughs> one, two, three, four times ten listeners. Um, some of your gems because I think you know you you epitomize busy at the moment. You're a, a striving to be a professional rugby player playing rugby union for your country you are a proud Fijian woman you Australian woman you are a tv host a radio host a rugby pundit a MC a commentator you name it at the moment <laughs> in media Sarah you're doing it uh, so I just want to say firstly welcome and secondly can't wait to have a conversation with you. Oh, Em, I'm already getting emotional because you're one of my greatest friends. But no, genuinely, thank you so much for having me. I mean, it's so cool that you're doing this. And I know it's been something that you've been working on privately. Um, and I think just speaking to what you said, like you're doing something that's out of your comfort zone, but I think you're going to have so much fun because you're a fantastic communicator. So I'm actually really excited to see what we're going to, where we're going to take our yarn today. Where Just we don't expose me on your podcast and you know all my secrets too. I have actually had some pretty um, evil thoughts about uh, <laughs> ways that I could bring you into a... Oh, you know me so intimately, which is a great. Right? I want to know your guess. We're going to um, go down a bit of a detailed path. Yeah. I think like trying to give people what you probably haven't talked about necessarily on, mm -hmm. on other podcasts. But I want to start with what is currently on your plate. Like, what does the life of Sarah Nagama look like at the moment? Bit going on, in short. What am I doing? I actually, this morning, um, recorded my final show for Can You Be More Pacific, which has been hosted on an ABC platform. It's actually crazy because that radio show um, was the first ever thing I did in radio and has been the long, most consistent, long-standing um, so there's a lot of emotional connection um, between me and the show, as well as my co-host, Dean Hallatow and our producer, Renelle. So as of today, no longer a radio host, but have been so for the past two years. Um, off that, I am a co-host on That Pacific Sports Show, which we record every Monday and it airs every Wednesday um, throughout Australia and the Pacific. I'm really, really proud of that because I do it alongside Sammy Wax and Tiana Penatani. And then... Aside from ABC, I do work with Stan Sports. I am, I used to say pundit. Yeah. I'm a commentator. Yeah, you are. I'm owning that title. I am a commentator. And that's actually been a journey of itself, trying to embrace that title. Um, but I, I've been very fortunate um, to be part of that network for the past two years um, and had, you know, been able to do some Super W action, more so Super Rugby Pacific and Wallabies. Very excited to say that I'll be on World Cup coverage as well. Oh my God. So a bit, there's so much happening there. But um, outside of the the TV and radio, um, I regularly MC gigs, um, or sit on sit on panels such as yourself. Um, so my Monday to Friday doesn't look the same every week. Probably the most consistent part is Mondays being in the studio and Thursdays, um, but no longer as of next week. And then everything else is just um, very fortunate to be in a position where. Um, work has continually come in the door for me um, in the world of media. Nice. And when you're not working, talk me through the... Ooh, yeah, the there's other stuff. <laughs> the, the other probably 70% of your, <laughs> your life. No, and that is that is such a, 
of a an accurate percentage like the 80 percent of me is my rugby yeah. um which it's pretty hectic so right now at the moment we are preparing with the Wallaroos um well we're in season with them essentially we are in a pretty hectic training block right now we're in between campaigns came out of pack four had a very mixed bag of results yeah but preparing for hopefully a very successful LOR and after that a world 15 comp and training for us is Monday and Wednesday but that's just our structured sessions yeah and then you'll find us well, M has signed us up for spring training <laughs> on Tuesdays. She's also signed us up for extras with Wombat on Thursdays. And then we have to do an extra gym session on Fridays. And then Saturday this week, we're running because of Clint. And then Sunday, you'll catch us in the sauna at Daysville. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty accurate, right? That's pretty but accurate. I just want to let you know that M has signed us up for our Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yeah. Because she's the hardest worker in the room. She's taking us with her. Yeah, you know, so, it's hard to be lonely, right? That, <laughs> you want to die with your friends, right? You absolutely do. So, yeah, there's, there's a bit going on, right? Yes. There is so much going on. I have a question for you off that. You yes. said you no longer want to call yourself a pundit. You want to call yourself a commentator. Talk to me what your definition of a pundit is. So a pundit is someone that is engaged to kind of share their perspective mm -hmm. on the game, um, which is what I do mm -hmm. essentially. But I think that's changed for me because I have commentated. Yeah. And so does do I say I'm a pundit and a commentator mm -hmm. or do I find solace in you're a commentator and you're okay to own that? Um, I think why it scared me to embrace yeah. that title is because there's a great level of detail yeah. in that. And am I saying that I know it all? No, I don't. But when I think about it in the context of rugby, do I know everything about rugby? No, but does that make me any less of a rugby player? No. So why does it apply there? Yeah. Um, so that's just the biggest moment for me was when I changed it in my Instagram bio. Because normally I would have it as like, stand sport. Yeah. I did. But I'm like, no, nah, girl. Let's go. Let's go commentator. And then you can be cancelled later if someone else calls you out. I love that for you. I love it. I was going to go into like a bit of a rugby conversation here, but I think we're on media and we're on Stan Sport. We're on that Pacific Sports show. Talk to me about the production behind the scenes. So for a lot of people, we all see this shiny polished piece at the end, which is what we see on TV or we listen to on radio but I know and I want I think the people want to know a lot more about the behind the scenes. So things like how long does it take? Like what's your time frame for a for a 40 minute episode for say rugby heaven? Are you there three hours before? What's the what's the day look like? I think you highlighted something really important that there's there's definitely a degree of preparation that goes into it and it varies depending on what kind of production you are on. Um I think viewers would most be uh, intrigued to know what they say like say a, a, a scan if yeah. we're, if we're covering, yeah. game, game day game coverage great game, game day coverage if your kickoff is at seven yeah. we're probably there around two to three um and that's because we go in and we have a roster or hair and makeup so you kind of rotate it and everyone knows if you've ever worked for me on tv i take the longest <laughs> to get ready and it's because god bless me with this beautiful coarse hair yes that takes an extra bit of tlc and um so i'm typically the first one yeah they give wow. me the most time because as soon because essentially the most you'll ever have um is like two girls so it's mostly ever just alana and i or just one of us never yeah. two girls at uh, more than two girls and then the boys are essentially like five minutes they just kind of tap it on them yeah. um so we get there i get there pretty early um hair and makeup and then following hair and makeup you'll have a production meeting essentially one hour yeah out of kickoff time yeah um and then you kind of figure out from there or you find out you know no you can't talk about kind of the format for the evening. Yeah. And then they send you out. Yes. And so talking about the preparation that comes, because you don't just come to the production meeting and find out what you're going to do. Yeah. You may get your run sheet max two days out, but mostly the night before the game or the show or whatever it is you're preparing for. And my research time has seriously condensed from when I first started. So my first game was in 2021, Bledisloe 3. Nice. I... Not kidding. God is my witness. I spent about 11 hours preparing. Wow. Do you remember your yeah, first time you did a show? Yeah. The, like game day coverage, you spend yeah. so much time because you want to be so well prepared for it, right? Yeah. But then as I, like I could quote any newspaper that spoke about Adi Savia that week. <laughs> because that was his first test that he captain for the All Blacks. Amazing. Um, but I was just, because I, I, it was never ever my dream to be a commentator yeah. or to even be on telly to talk about rugby yeah everyone knows i want to be an oprah winfrey 
That's always been my dream. I hope you get giving out cars. And yeah, I well, I'll give out cars. I'll give you a car first. I'll give you. myself a car. Um, but from that point, how I learned to refine my research process is to, to try and stay across um, headlines all throughout the week. So obviously rugby is the sport that we play and yeah. that's what I cover in, in yeah. commentary. So I spend a lot of time just trying to read up on rugby see what the different players doing, yeah. check their Instagrams, try and just get a feel, understand what's happening this week in their world. Um, and, and not just the side that I go for, but also the opposing side, right? Yeah. Because you want them to have as much detail about them. Yeah. So then once I stay across that throughout the week, once I get my run sheet, that's what I prepare my notes on. Yeah. Because that's what we're most likely going to talk about. And then all the extra stuff kind of just helps fill in gaps when, oh, so, you know, you might be in a bit of a break, like let's talk about All Blacks and Ireland. Yeah. Do you think I know about all those islands as much as that team that's playing that night? Absolutely not. But that's why you try and stay yeah. across the general headlines so yeah. you stay prepared. So my my um preparation now yeah. probably takes me like I feel very comfortable if I can get like a nice five hours. Nice. Um, just so that I can write things down, read up a little bit more. Um, and I do also want to make sure mention that we are very privileged to have access to um a lady who sends out these information packs to us. So we don't just do all of our own research while that definitely complements anything yeah. that we're given. Um, we get these data packs that gives you detail on both teams, key players, their stats, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. that's the, that's kind of like the prep. Yeah. That's the hardest part. Yeah. Right. And then once you get to half time, you're talking about first half, you get to full time, talk about second half. Yeah. And Makes then, sense. yeah. So it's, it's crazy, but it's, um, it's a lot of work, but I feel like just the more that you do it, the more easy it becomes. Yeah, cool. That's really easy. Is that good English? Yeah. More easier? More easier. Probably not. Okay, not with good English. The yeah. easier it becomes. The easier it becomes. <laughs> yeah, the easier it becomes. Yeah, the easier it becomes. Um, so you have these little earpieces in yeah. when you're on show. Mm -hmm. Are they, uh, is someone talking to you all the time? Is someone telling you what to say? Are they, what, are they cueing you? What's their purpose? So that'll be the producer in your ear. Every time you see an earpiece, it's because you have a producer in it, yeah? Um, so your host yeah. will hear more than what you do because they also have someone counting them down because you have to have clean breaks into ads, etc. cetera. Course, yeah. um, what I hear through my ear is, say, for instance, if we're in interviewing Emily Chancellor, mm. she the boys might be talking, whoever, and they might prompt you to ask a question or they might be saying to you, um, no time, don't ask anything more. So they're basically there to keep you accountable yeah. to time, also to prompt you if, perhaps you haven't inserted yourself enough into a conversation. Um, and sometimes when you're talking to someone, someone else may have not picked up on a theme or a question that's probably appropriate to yeah. ask. So again, they just prompt you. So it's, it's more so an accountability and a prompter. Um, and it's, it's, sometimes it's reassuring to have someone in your ear. Yeah. Um, because often, and I've, I've definitely experienced this and it was a new thing for me is, and I experienced it in Gold Coast, when there's so much, the crowd is hectic. Yeah. And all these fireworks. I don't know why the fireworks were going off, but there were halftime fireworks. And we were still live on air. And I couldn't hear what I was being asked. But then the producer would prompt me, yeah, they're asking you this. Uh, so they're also a little bit of a safety guard for you as well. That's great. That's really handy. Because I always imagined having someone sitting in your ear would almost be like the voice inside your head that stops you being able to listen to the conversation that you're Yeah, in. no, less is definitely more. And because they know that you're like trying to engage in a conversation and they might be dropping something here. So they're very succinct, um, very concise. Ask this, no more. Interesting, interesting. And how do you go about asking questions? Like when you're thrown on the spot, do you ever go, I don't have a question for you? Oh, I've certainly had times when I've been sat on a couch or on a panel and they're like, you know, the, the host will give you eyes, like you've got yeah. something to say. And I'm like, mm, I've got nothing. <laughs> um, but more times than often, I just, just genuine curiosity. Yeah. That when you, when something doesn't make sense or you want to gain better understanding, but there were also, um, there are, there are cliche questions, right? Halftime, what are we going to fall? What was the chat like at halftime in the change room? So there are certainly cliche ones that you fall back on. Um, But say, for instance, in the lead up to World Cup, there there's a genuine excitement as to what we're about to embark on. Yes. And there's genuine excitement for me too. So I think that this is a great opportunity for me to try and like steer away from the cliches and ask good questions. Yeah. Because you can get asked rubbish questions too, right? Yeah. Everyone's had a rubbish question at half time or. I've certainly game. asked rubbish questions as a commentator. Like I don't ask the right questions all the time. Like I remember one time I was talking to, uh, oh, I, 
Oh, what's his name? Starts with an R. Plays for Melbourne Rebels. Not Hodge. The other one. Oh, my God. His mm -hmm. name escapes me. No, not back to more. A back, a forward. His back. Oh, my gosh, Emily. I can see his face. He has a brother. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> Seriously. We'll just uh, watch this face. Yeah, watch this face. Oh, it'll come to me in a second, yeah. Anywho, they were up against, it was, uh, it was, the Rebels up against the Crusaders. Yeah. And the Crusaders just had the upper hand yeah. at half time. And I, like, explained in this interview, I was like, well, like, how do you think you guys are going to go against such a formidable side like the Crusaders? And it was like, formidable side? Sure, using your words, uh, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. And I was oh, like, oh, I didn't them. ask the right question. Um, so there are definitely a lot of learning and growing yeah. moments, but in terms of the questions, yeah, they just come organically. Um, but I, I, you definitely have cliche ones that you fall back on. Yeah. You've experienced them. We've asked you them. Yeah, cliche questions get cliche answers, and that isn't always what you – sometimes it's what you need in, in a bit of a buffer, but I guess it's also if you really want the audience to engage, you've got to ask good questions mm -hmm. that keep them wanting to hear more, not running off to the toilet at halftime as well. Exactly that. Um, continuing on this kind of theme of Stan and, and the, the makeup and hair – Sarah, we all know Sarah Nagama as the bit of a fashionista. She likes <laughs> to make a statement with what she wears. She's always bold and the socials show it to, to the nines that you, you dress up and you dress up well. Is there inspiration or a, or a drive behind always looking like you do? That's such a compliment. Thank you, Emily Chancellor. <laughs> um, no, I love getting dressed up and I think I've always been like that. Um, I mean, you can certainly testify to whether it's true or not. But even before all of this, like, I loved getting dressed yeah. up. Um, I, To me, how I interpret fashion is it's an extension of my personality. And I love to be perceived um, the way that I'm dressed. And I actually had this kind of instilled in me as a kid because my bumbo, who you've met, who's a very yes. cult lady, yes. um, she loved getting dressed up. And I have such vivid memories of sitting on the bed on a Saturday afternoon and she would pull all her clothes out for church on Sunday. Yeah. And she would spend hours, wow. hours, I'm not kidding, hours choosing her skirt. My grandma never wore pants to church. Yeah. Barely ever wore a dress. She always wore skirts, skirts with a matching top to her necklace, to the rings that she wore, to the bracelet that she had. Um, and she had an extensive range of handbags. And so I just remember sitting there as a kid and I'm like, oh man, like hurry up. Like yeah. I want to go go watch like Australia's funniest home videos. Yeah. <laughs> Good quality TV. Show, man. <laughs> Good show. And so I kind of grew up being exposed to that. So when I had the opportunity to start getting dressed up a little bit throughout high school, like you know, before you know, like I'd be going to school and I'd have like a bangle on, like you know what I'm yeah. thinking about, like of course you do. Yeah. Like I'd have one of her yeah. bangles on. Um, and just like color, color coordination was such a thing for me. But now um, being in this media space, I don't feel like it's un like I'm not uncomfortable to get dressed up um, because it's something that I love to do. Um, and then, like I said, it's just an extension of my personality. And there's such a, I feel like, a, I don't know if stigma is the right word, but people often say they're good clothes. Oh, I'm saving that. Mm. Oh, I'm saving that. Mm. What are you saving it for? That's so true. Like, why do you say you spend this money and you love this dress or you love this outfit? Like, stop saving your good outfits. Wear your damn good outfit. Um, <laughs> and so that's what I do. And, like, even now when I, like, go on air and stuff, I try and, like, I'm you know, perception is important. Yeah. Um, and I, like, I love getting dressed up. And if I can influence my wardrobe, I will. Have I always loved my options? Not necessarily. Yes. Um, but sometimes you just grin and bang. You're like, it's not about the clothes. It's about the words that come out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> you know? So cool. you grin and bang sometimes, but whenever I have the chance, um, I'll hire the dress. I'll pay the money. I'll ask to borrow because I just love getting dressed up. Go, girl. girl. I, I remember you saying once, and I don't know if this is um, still part of the drive, but you did once say to me that you intended to wear bright colours and and make a statement with your clothes because if people were already going to look at you because you're a Fijian tall, strong woman, that you may as well give them something good to look at. Um, I did say that. <laughs> that sounds very on par for Stone and Gama. I was curious if that's still sort of part of the drive. Is it like you always have felt that people look at you so you make a bigger statement of, of, of fine, I'm choosing for you to look at me, not you look at me for whatever reason you choose to look at? Yeah, I mean... Probably. I think that's a lot. That, that, I mean, that's true, right? Yeah. Like, and to be fair, you, God, what a girl. She really yeah. said that. It was such a bold statement. But, <laughs> and I feel like now, even if I don't want people to look at me, they are looking at me because yeah. I live 
my life in front of a screen a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, look, to be honest, it, if they've got to look at you, make sure it's something worthwhile. So remember me in this orange dress. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of appearances, you've got a couple of tattoos. I do. Um, some hidden. Some hidden, some for, <laughs> not for other people's vision. That's okay. I want to talk about the one on your forearm. Yes. Can you tell me what it says? This reads, I am the woman in the arena. It's powerful. It's very powerful. Thank you. And I believe it's written in your grandma's handwriting. Is that yes, right? it's written in my Wumbo's handwriting. handwriting. And the quote is an adaption, isn't it? It is. From Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. Yes. He's, it's an extract from Man in the Arena. Cool. So I'm obviously not a man. No. I'm, I'm not. All, I, Right. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> no, definitely a girl. Great, great. Yeah, definitely a girl. Definitely great. a girl. Um, no, I just I remember coming across um that abstract man in the arena in Brene Brown's book, Braving the Wilderness. And Brene Brown is someone that has certainly influenced my life and my yeah. perception on the world. Um, and I read it so many times because she she quotes it quite often throughout a book. And then I remember she quotes, I am a man in the arena. No, she quotes man in the arena. It, yeah. it shows up that abstract yeah. a fair bit. And I remember reading it, like, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes when you read poetry and you think, ah, thou what? (laughs) (laughs) Shakespearean? (laughs) What the what? Like, yeah, I don't know what you're saying to me. And then I remember, it must have been about 2018, it was like a light bulb bulb moment of, oh, I understand the picture she's trying to paint here. Talk us through the picture. The picture is an arena. Yeah. So think about like a warrior and another warrior, two warriors in Coliseum. an arena. Coliseum. Yeah. In a Coliseum. And it doesn't matter if you win or you lose. What matters is you're actually in that arena. And it's so easy to be a spectator and sit on the sidelines where you haven't counted the cost of sweat, tears, or blood being shed because you can spit your criticism. But it doesn't matter. You spit your criticism. What actually matters to me is that I'm in there and I'm having a crack and not the person just standing on the sideline watching over. I love that. I actually listened to someone talk today about how much more satisfying things are when there's a fear of the failure. Because if you if you're if you're doing something knowing you're going to succeed without before you've even started, the reward you get from entering into that arena kind of loses its its specialness. Whereas mm-hmm. it, when there's a risk of failure. And then you succeed, you have that like ultimate like feeling of success that drives you to do something again. And I think putting yourself or being like challenging yourself to go into a space where you're not 100% confident that you're either going to succeed or be great is so much more rewarding because you firstly, you're challenging yourself, you're growing. And secondly, like that feeling of endorphin, I guess, Mm -hmm. that you get when you go, I've, I've, almost prove people wrong even though you weren't doing it to prove people wrong you've proven yourself right and that is so empowering so what, what an that. awesome quote <clears throat> awesome quote right. um speaking of speaking of the quote like and I was going to reference um Brene Brown because I know that she is someone that inspires sort of the person that you are and how you tackle the world and and lead and and all of that are, are there other people that you look to that inspire you be being family friend like inside and outside your your world yeah I I love that question about like who inspires you because I feel like you never have the same inspirations in every season of your life they yeah. vary depending on what you're going through or yeah. what you experience whether life is good or whether it's bad um for me like constant figures have definitely been my brothers Wesley and Kevin so they one Wesley he's a retired NRL player Kevin he's still playing at the moment um, and to me, why they inspire me so much is because we have the exact same upbringing um, and they have created a legacy around our family name that I, I'm just going to cough, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> Not emotional yet. Not emotional yet. Probably coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they essentially created a legacy around our family name that I felt a sense of belonging and inclusion in. And I know it sounds quite cheesy when you like put it that way, um, but there was a like for me, I was so proud to like be in the playground and be like, my brothers play for the Knights or Wesley plays yeah. for the Dragons, you know? Like I used to take Wesley's, I remember there was this poster and half of it was Matt Cooper and half of it was Wesley Gama. And I used to be like, that's my brother. <laughs> that's so cool. Like, so cheesy, like in you four, just like trying to 
shed the good news of Wes Van Gama on this half poster of him and Matt Cooper. <laughs> the power of inspiration. They're like, how proud that you are to be a, a family member of someone on a physical poster like that. Yeah. Like that, that's the that's a tangible like proof that someone is is famous or doing something. Yeah. Like he is on a poster. That's and he it. just like inspired me so much. And um Kevin, um Kevin as well. And the thing is like with the boys, they while they were very talented, they actually had to work at the same, like quite similar to the, the fight we're in in terms of yeah. semi-professionalism. Wesley was working at um the St. George uh, Leagues Club. So he was like a bartender. So he would do like Jersey Fleet, which is equivalent to reserves. Yeah. And then go and work there in the bar. Because like my parents, they separated when we were quite young. So we lived with my grandma and he was like trying to help bring money through the house, which was like crazy, crazy kind of sacrifice to make. And then Kevin as well, when he got signed to Newcastle and was in the under 20s program, he would wake up at three, ride his bike because he didn't have a car, ride his bike to the post office to sort mail before he went to go train. And so... That's a proper humble beginning. That's his proper humble yeah. beginnings. Like it wasn't, like I love being able to hear my friends talk about how they got mom and dad to drive them to sport, et cetera, et cetera. Was, that wasn't necessarily our narrative and I don't feel any kind of like, oh, I feel sorry for us. It's just like, that just wasn't our story, you know? Yeah. And like, it's so cool to know that the boys had to grind the way that they did and they had the careers that they had um, and it wasn't given, it was yeah. earned. Yeah, um, and so I think, like, to me, that, like, that's really inspiring. And I think, to answer your question, in short, it's my siblings. And then I look at my my sister, Rhonda, and she doesn't have a sporting bone in her body. <laughs> and if you know Rhonda, you know exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> we love Rhonda. We love Rhonda. Um, but to me, um, again, like, kind of, I kind of shed a little bit of light. Like, my parents, they separated when we were quite young. And Rhonda is just, like, such a phenomenal mom. And I know that my parents did absolutely everything they could to give us the life that we have. But seeing Rhonda kind of break generational um, patterns and, yeah. and you know, have this beautiful home, beautiful marriage, be a beautiful mom and a wife, to me, I'm like, that's so cool because now your babies are going to grow Like, my nieces are going to grow up and see that. And yeah. so, like, I've just... Like my my siblings inspire me both on and off the field in the way that they have, and like I just I just try and do my part so that they feel proud too because I'm so proud of them. I'm sure that they're very proud of you too. <laughs> well, thanks, Emmy. Um, going into that like the side of like family and, yeah. and the, the, them playing them playing rug, rugby, even though the wrong code, I would say no judgment here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the you debuted for Australia in 2022. Yes. In May. Oh, yeah. The 6th of May, I think it was. Yes. I'm thinking off the top of my head. Uh, against Fiji. What an incredible opportunity to be able to blend two cultures, firstly, that like you're an Australian born Fijian mm-hmm. woman and you get to play representing your country, Australia, against your culture of Fiji. Like, what sort of memories does that game bring, the, the experience? Oh, it was all the feelings. I remember because we get told the team about two nights before we yeah. we play. Yeah. Um, and we were in Brisbane. No, sorry, the Gold Coast. Yeah. And we had a hectic day. Like we had a sponsors That's day right. where they just set up all these booths, and we were. It was crazy, and we knew that team selection was that night. And I remember. I don't know if you remember this, but you came and pulled me aside. And you said, have you been spoken to today? Because if you don't know, you kind of get tapped on the shoulder before team announcement, whether you're in the 23 or not. Yeah. And I said to you, no, not yet. Um, like, good. And you said to me, regardless of what we get told today, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> regardless of what you get told, because we already knew that everything, like, you know, doesn't matter. And what you were trying to refer to is doesn't matter what number you have on your back, yeah. you're in this week. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'm in this week. And the emotions were crazy yeah they were definitely crazy because we've been on we had been on the longest grind up the lead up to that test match for two years we didn't have a test the last time I'd represented Australia was Australia A back in 2019 yeah um and that was a year of notes anyone that was been on that journey with us that was a year of notes for me yeah and I was like they're like you know hold the line says like next year's going to be your year and then that was 2021 there was nothing and then it came to oh no 2020 and the 2021 is yeah. the same thing so I think when we when I finally you know got told that I was going to be playing that week. My family came up. It was just, it was a very emotional, emotional um, anthem. Yeah. Um, Because we're next to each other. We did. And we have this very iconic photo of us embracing and smiling at each other. Um, But I, oh, I get goosebumps. I think I get goosebumps. (laughs) But it's crazy because any time that I had been in a change room for the Wallaroos prior to that match, I was always setting up the change rooms. 
and oh, this is bringing the memories yeah. down. <laughs> and there's a, I have a vivid memory of like putting the four, the five, and the nineteen jersey up, being like, I would have done anything to be in any one of yeah. these jerseys. Yeah. Um, and then, but you know, throughout that time, I learned how to serve my team. Mm-hmm. And then I was given the opportunity where I walked into a change room that I hadn't necessarily prepared. And I could empathize with the girls that didn't get to play that day, but I was so proud of myself that I was able to actually be them, put a jersey on and run out with the girls. And so, yeah, it was definitely emotional. And for my family as well, like it was so cool to have them in the stands because, yeah, they migrated to Australia. Um, I'm from, I have a Fijian background. So the meshing of two cultures is like the fact that it even happened is such a rarity. Yeah. Um, but what a blessing that that was how I was able to debut for Australia. Incredible. Incredible, Sarah. Um, and I, I know you just touched on the grind and the amount of time that you you spent touring and training and the lead up to it. And my question is, is does it feel like it, it was worth it for that moment? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because you don't just get to be part of a 23. You have to earn your way into a 23. And I know that my my earning period was probably dragged out a fair bit. Yes, yeah. But that's because I I felt like I deserved it earlier than that, right? Yeah. And essentially we know in those environments you don't get to dictate because everyone wants to play because they all believe they deserve it yeah and so yeah it makes it it's probably one of the most satisfying moments in my life because you can't buy your selection you can't buy your test cap you earn that moment and I earned it and no one can ever take away Wallery 186 powerful yeah powerful well thanks girl um leads me nicely into the the core sort of question that I um I want to ask my guests on on the show is when have you taken a chance and it paid off? Because I think you know we're going down that 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 sort of more emotional, more deep, come more deep, a deeper <laughs> conversation um in terms of like inspiration. And yeah, I think like that's obviously that was a huge moment that took a lot of work. But when have you sort of taken a leap of faith or taken a chance on um, something and it paid off? Oh, big question. Yeah, it could be work, it could be life, social life, love, rugby, media. There's one that certainly comes to mind. Yeah. <clears throat> so last year was such a big year. It was yeah. very turbulent. Um, I was in a seven-year relationship um, and that ended quite early in the year and that was like right in the thick of us about to launch into our Wallaroo season. Yeah. And it's World a World Cup. Cup. And, yeah. It's a World Cup year. And World Cup year definitely hits differently to any other year because Amen. The, <laughs> the training load, the tours, yeah. like everything is just heightened because the stakes of that tournament are much higher, right? And that naturally requires more. And so I remember it was like personally, internally, I was everywhere. And then when this is everywhere, this is everywhere too. Yeah. And then physically we're being maxed out every single time we go to a session. Like there is not a session that you come out half assed because you cannot get away with it. You can't hide. Yeah. Let me just say, you can't hide at our training because you've got accountability police over here. <laughs> <laughs> that makes us take an extra step behind the paint. <laughs> I understand it. I understand it. Um, but then I just remember it getting to an absolute boiling point for me because rugby was ramping up. My media stuff was becoming more and more um that I had to keep asking my bosses oh can you please let me work from home this morning oh can I just make up for that extra hour here and having to make all these alternate arrangements to try and accommodate my media stuff now the thing with media is it's also quite a fickle world if you do not have a contract or a network contract that enables you to know hey I'm going to get paid every fortnight there's no job security there's no job security particularly if you're in the world of a freelancer, right? So then I just remember um, I had a conversation with a workplace yeah, and they basically said, well, if you go, mind you, I dropped from five days to yeah. three days yeah. to try and make more room for rest. Yes. But what I ended up doing was picking up more work <laughs> so that I was working <laughs> and like media because it could be like seven days if you yeah. needed it to be, yeah. right? Like, so it was just pretty hectic. And I just remember having a conversation with this workplace. I said, well, like, if you finish World Cup on a Saturday, you're going to come to work on the Monday, right? And I was like, what? Like, yeah, if you finish, like, like you just need an extra week off and then you're going to come back to work. And I'm thinking, do you understand how big of a platform, the pinnacle that Rugby World Cup represents? Yeah. And for me, I was kind of in this, this I guess, this gap of, like, 
I can go to World Cup and then I'm going to have to rush back home. Or I can go to World Cup, give myself the mental freedom and release of any responsibility back home. Mm -hmm. And then when I come back from World Cup, I'll try and find another job and just kind of hope that things will work itself out. Can confidently say, I'm still not on a payroll. <laughs> I went to World Cup. I had the best time of my life. I've got a Vegas and a wife this year. And she's still not on a payroll. Still not on a nine to five, five J-O-B. J-O-B. Just don't need it, girl. It's just like, and like, that's not to say that like, oh, I'm like bloody wealthy or anything like that. But there was a, a moment to take a chance of like, will I let the fear of scarcity um, and, and I guess fear override an opportunity to be a once in a lifetime opportunity you never know if you're going to get a second yeah. world cup a once a lifetime opportunity to be fully present and try and put your best foot forward and can i just say how i went in i had made that decision before we had our pre-world cup camp yeah which was just a one-week camp then we had five days yeah. before we left i went into that camp and it was the best camp i had been to all year because you're fully present, no fully emotion. present, yeah, like not emotionally attached or mentally distracted about responsibilities, and I just I had fun. Yeah. Like I remember, it was the first camp we'd been on a couple of camps that yeah. year, yeah, not a couple, a few, and I just it was always a struggle for me. Like, oh, okay, yeah, like yeah. it's let's just get through it. Kind of counting down the days until you got out of camp, and you get back to work. This is happening. This is happening. Went to World Cup, and I was just free. And I like think. If, if I didn't train the way that I did throughout that pre-World Cup camp, I don't know how we've shown up to our World Cup campaign. And I think because that preparation was probably the best I'd ever done throughout the whole year that earned me my first start, which was like the biggest bloody game of my life. Yes. <laughs> you remember that game? Yes. We started together. Yes. Um, but that was like that was essentially a moment of like taking a chance, like not knowing what was on the other side and like, you know, I kind of prefaced earlier in the show that I did recorded my last radio show. Yeah. Um, and we were in Canada when I first found out that news and it rattled me to my core because I thought, oh my God, like, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna get this money? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but I'm just like, well, and I'm a believer. I'm like, God didn't leave me high and dry back then. So what's gonna say he's gonna do it this time around? So it definitely takes an element um of harnessing that fear, but also believing and being hopeful that things will work itself out because that's what it does, regardless of whether you believe in high power or not. Unreal. Imagine, yeah, it's a really scary place to think that you had to choose between sort of financial security and making a decision to to strive to be the best you can be as a rugby player. But it's obviously paid off because the media world is where you're so naturally placed as well. Exactly. So to be able to take those um, ad hoc and and hopefully more permanent roles in terms of media has obviously provided you the opportunity to be this sort of more flexible lifestyle rugby player that allows the training and the and as well to be able to pay your rent. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm like, I'm happy, you know? And I think that's the biggest thing is yeah. that like when you're not, when you're fearful, you're not happy. And I don't want to live in fear. And like, I know that, yeah, like, like it all, it'll work itself out. And I'm a big believer in like whatever's meant for you will never pass you. And I try and hold on to that when I'm fearful. I try and hold on to that when things get scary or when I've had to take a chance. Yeah. Nice. Plug. Nice. <laughs> um, and, and it grounds me every time because I'm like, it is like what's meant for me will never pass me. So cool. And then I guess the second question on my cliche question line is, is there a time when someone that you, that you've recognized that someone else has had, has taken a huge chance on you um, and has it paid off? <laughs> in honesty, and in a, in a day where there's been a lot of reflection, um, Nick Morris, and I know that's just a name to some people, but he's um, works at ABC Sport um, overseas. A lot of the production that happens, they're both on air and on screen. Yeah. And my opportunity in radio, which is essentially what launched all of this media stuff for me, was appearing on the show that I'm now a host of as a guest. And basically he sent me a text message being like, says, I saw that you are on the show. Yeah. I have an opportunity I want to talk to you about. And basically because of how I presented myself on a show, yeah. he offered me a radio gig. Wow. And you cannot tell me that's not taking a chance on someone that you honestly just saw come onto your show as a guest. Um, and I think how brave of him to do so. Yeah. But 
he backed me and he put people and resources around me to try and encourage me to be a better presenter and look where it's resulted yeah. for me now like yeah. my career I don't want to sound like a dick but like it kind of speaks for itself yeah and it's purely because Nick Morris took a chance on me back then that's awesome thank you Nick thanks Nick <laughs> you're a man <laughs> so if we sort of look towards uh the future and almost wrapping up this show sorry guys it's almost over oh, uh, no. No. What, like, where where is Sarah Nagama heading next? Like, what's next in the horizon in Ooh. terms of of life? Is it over the next 6 to 12 months or future and beyond? Well, I am definitely committed to my rugby career. Nice. We both are. Yes. Um. So for us, I think, for, speaking from a rugby perspective, we still have two big tours this year. And my, my goal and deepest desire is to be part of those squads um, and to not just be part of those squads but to play and World 15 which is our last one for the year is the biggest platform we'll have second to a World Cup um, yeah. and we're going to go up some against some giants but I'm really looking forward to it nonetheless so yeah from a rugby perspective that's what I'm looking forward to outside of that I definitely want to try and continue my commentary work um, I'm very fortunate to be part of World Cup coverage that's coming up in 15 days at time of recording Ooh. at time of recording 15 days <laughs> 15 days to go. You've just exposed how long it's going to take me to edit this episode. <laughs> <laughs> my girl, you know, my girl, I'd like you to like, try and see you start a podcast. Um, but no, seriously, it's going to take that like World Cup coverage is going to be humongous. Yeah. Um, and then great time zone to be commentating in. Rough. <laughs> it's rough. Remember, I told you you have to get there three hours when yeah. you're watching the game and it kicks off at three o'clock, one o'clock, four o'clock. You just think about what time Stacey got into the studio. Oh, no. <laughs> you better not have driven there because she will have had to have had a nap. Okay, don't no, relax with the exposure on sleeping on the M5. <laughs> um, so the commentary went with the tea, and I've got a couple of um, sevens tournaments locked in for the summer, which I'm really looking forward to being part of in Fiji and continuing with the World Surf when it hits over in Australia. Love that for you, Sarah. Final question from me. Um, are you reading anything interesting or are you listening to something or what, like, are you stimulating your mind with that isn't rugby or social media based that is sort of keeping you thinking or allowing you to relax? Um, probably a bit of a different one. Yeah. Um, so I've really started to prioritize being back in church on Sunday mornings. Love. Um, life is pretty hectic for us at the minute. Um, I certainly am feeling a lot of a lot yeah <laughs> thinking about a lot feeling a lot body's going through a fair bit at the moment yeah um so for me my solace is a sunday morning and i do that with a friend that we both love and adore a tussie life life oh beautiful um, so it's just been really nice to prioritize something that means so much to me and it gives me a lot of pieces of being heading into the week so it's um that's where i've been that's where i've been i love that that's really special i think it's really important that everyone has there I don't want to call it an escape but a way of being able to switch pull back and 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 focus on you and focus on just being rather than it be so caught up in the busyness of the world that's why I'm I'm getting back into reading because I think being able to take myself away from the world that I'm living in and take myself to somewhere magical and and interesting and not that my life isn't interesting but just taking taking yourself away from from your current problems um is so important so yeah. that's church for you on a Sunday how good. Beautifully articulated, Emily. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate you coming Aww. and joining me on Life of Chance podcast. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Life of Chance is pretty good and it's pretty good because of the people that are in it. So thanks for being part of my life and thanks for being part of the podcast today. Beautiful. And before I go, I just want to say this is so cool that you're starting this. I said it at the beginning, but I know that this is a passion project for you, but Emily takes a lot of guts and that's all I've ever known you to be is like you are a risk taker and you're passionate and I have no doubt that for however long or little this lasts <laughs> it's going to be beautiful and something that we talk about over a bottomless brunch because we're both a sucker for it <laughs> love it thanks so much for coming on the series you're welcome my girl oh and that was fabulous